As I was talking to a physicist at CERN, he said the raison d'etre for the Large Hadron Collider now is to try and discover dark matter. We could discover new particles like supersymmetry, we could discover dark matter. All throughout the world, physicists couldn't contain their elation at the launch of the world's most advanced and powerful high-energy particle collider. They had waited decades for such a moment, and now they could witness how this incredible innovation transformed humankind's view of the cosmos. After a painfully long construction phase, the European Organization for Nuclear Research's Large Hadron Collider began operations in September 2008. Although it took the machine's creators several years to perfect the collider, the Large Hadron Collider has subsequently helped scientists solve many of the mysteries of the universe. Recently, however, scientists from CERN revealed that when they increased the Large Hadron Collider's maximum beam energy, they noticed something unexpected and disturbing. They've been attempting to speculate since the incident to explain what happened, but all they have are speculations at this point. Join us in today's video as something unusual is happening at CERN. The Large Hadron Collider is the largest and most powerful particle accelerator in the world. It became operational on September 10, 2008 and is still the most recent addition to CERN's accelerator complex. The LHC is a 27-kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating components to raise particle energy along the way. Two high-energy particle beams move at near to the speed of light inside the accelerator before colliding. The beams flow in opposite directions in separate beam pipes, which are two ultra-high vacuum tubes. A strong magnetic field maintained by superconducting electromagnets guides them around the accelerator ring. The electromagnets are made from coils of a unique electric cable that operates in a superconducting condition, efficiently conducting electricity without resistance or energy loss. This necessitates cooling the magnets to minus 271.3 degrees Celsius, which is colder than outer space. As a result, much of the accelerator is linked to a liquid helium distribution system, which cools the magnets as well as other supply services. To steer the beams around the accelerator, Thousands of magnets of various types and sizes are used. There are 1,232 dipole magnets 15 meters long that bend the beams and 392 quadrupole magnets 5 to 7 meters long that focus the beams. Another sort of magnet is used just before the collision to squeeze the particles close enough together, increasing the likelihood of collisions. Because the particles are so small, causing them to collide is similar to firing two needles 10 kilometers apart with such precision that they meet halfway. The CERN Control Center houses all of the accelerator's controls, services and technical equipment under one roof. The beams inside the LHC are then made to collide at four points around the accelerator ring, which correspond to the positions of four particle detectors, ATLAS, CMS, ALICE and LHCB. However, as the LHC began its third run last year, you must have been wondering what it will achieve and what it will seek for this time. Well, the giant particle accelerator has a new target set in its sights this time, the hunt for dark matter, the mysterious substance that must make up about 80% of all the matter in the universe, but which no one has ever seen. The fact that the vast majority of matter in the cosmos is invisible to us is remarkable. Astronomers believe dark matter exists because they find its gravitational fingerprints. Dark matter is the unseen cosmic substructure that keeps galaxies and galaxy clusters together. We just do not know what it is. Intriguingly, experiments at the Large Hadron Collider on the smallest scales may hold the key to solving one of the world's largest scale cosmic mysteries. However, since March 2021, the LHC collision experiments have discovered around 59 new hadrons in data acquired from the collider's first two runs. On July 5, 2022, it was revealed that a new sort of pentaquark, consisting of a charm quark, a charm antiquark, an up, a down, and a strange quark, was discovered while studying the decays of charged B mesons. After a few years of operation, every particle physics experiment suffers from declining returns. Since the device's prime results begin to be finished in years later, proportionally lower results are seen. The simplest solution is to enhance the devices involved, particularly in collision energy, brightness and improved detectors. 
Along with the projected rise in collision energy to 14 tera electron volts, a luminosity upgrade of a Large Hadron Collider known as the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider began in June 2018 and was expected to raise the accelerator's potential for new discoveries beginning in 2027. The purpose of this upgrade is to boost the machine's luminosity in order to improve the possibilities of visualizing infrequent processes and enhancing statistically marginal observations. The third run is seen as a transitional step in the Large Hadron Collider program. The discovery of the long-awaited Higgs boson was the main highlight of the first run. The primary accomplishment of the second run was the discovery of the major decay modes of the Higgs boson. These data confirm that, at least for the comparatively heavier known elementary particles, this particle is the origin of mass. CERN hopes that the anticipated third phase, which is scheduled to end in late 2025, will more than double the present LHC dataset. According to CERN insiders, the third run will be followed by a lengthier phase of preparation that could last until 2029. By then, the fully expanded LHC will have reactivated with a collision rate 10 times greater than the current one. The fourth run is expected to extend until 2042, and it will collect an eventual data set nearly 10 times greater than what is expected at the end of run 3. The analysis of a vast amount of data collected from recordings of collisions between protons at the Large Hadron Collider is essential to the study of high-energy particle physics at the LHC. The proton is their preferred particle since it is the easiest to handle and manipulate, allowing it to be accelerated to the highest energy. It is not, however, an elementary particle, rather it is a bound state of quarks kept together by particles known as gluons, which are quanta of the strong nuclear force. To better appreciate the LHC collisions, consider the proton as a bag of jelly beans containing quarks, gluons, antiquarks, and even heavier particles such as the W and Z bosons, which are quanta of the weak interactions responsible for radioactive decay. When two protons hit, the two bags of jelly beans will most likely be ripped apart, spilling out particles that will reform into protons, ions, kaons, and other more familiar particles. However, when only two quarks or gluons meet head-on, all of their energy is compressed into a tiny region and subsequently released back to the quarks and gluons, or possibly to the heavier known and undiscovered particles as well. Physicists can see the rules of nature at incredibly close ranges by examining and analysing these highly unusual reactions that result in massive energy releases. As data from the Large Hadron Collider is collected, these tests will be expanded, resulting in larger and larger samples of these rare reactions. Experts hope that ultimately enough events will collect to provide irrefutable evidence of a discovery. However, finding these rare hard collisions has become a massive data challenge. The Large Hadron Collider collides groups of protons 40 million times per second. There are at least 50 distinct proton-proton collisions in each of these bunch collisions. The photographic record of these collisions is subsequently written into permanent storage by the primary LHC detectors ATLAS and CMS. Because each of these images is approximately 20 times larger than a regular smartphone snap, storing all of the evidence for just one second would result in a million gigabyte database. However, the majority of the 40 million events in every second of data obtained are simple and familiar with only a few thousand W boson events and one Higgs boson event buried in this stream. As a result, one of the most important components of each LHC experiment is the trigger, which is a bank of computer processes that select a few hundred collisions each second for the permanent record that physicists will evaluate. Despite its extremely restrictive methodology, the LHC experiment has already produced one of the world's largest computational databases. The LHC's principal goal currently is to detect new elementary particles that could provide evidence for previously unknown fundamental interactions. Some of these new suggested particles may be heavy and decay to high energy clusters of quarks and leptons. However, scientists do not believe that such a particle will be identified in run 3. At most, these trials will yield some intriguing statistical suggestions and possibly some suggestive event pictures with unusual properties, which will get theorists talking. These predictions are expected to be confirmed by the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider in Run 4 and subsequent runs.
Searches for weakly connected new particles, such as those anticipated in dark matter models, present a great potential right now. Because such particles are formed at low rates, because they are produced by weak and electromagnetic interactions rather than strong interactions, any increase in the data set could be beneficial. The dark matter particle interacts too weakly to leave a signal in the Large Hadron Collider detectors. Nevertheless, this is not a problem because visible particles can be found recoiling against the invisible emissions using Newton's third law. However, in many theories, the partners of dark matter particles emit very little visible energy, resulting in tiny recoil signals that are not identified by the experiment's triggers. Run 3 trigger improvements are intended to improve coverage for such delicate signals, and the increased pace will assist lowering a sample of infrequent events in which recoiling particles are pushed out into easier vision. The enhancement will considerably improve ATLAS and CMS's capacity to recognize these signals. However, a new class of experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider, first envisioned by scientists, have recently established conditions more likely to produce monopoles. Before we proceed any further, let us explain what monopoles are. A magnetic monopole is a hypothetical elementary particle in particle physics that is an isolated magnet with only one magnetic pole, a north pole without a south pole or vice versa. A magnetic monopole would have a net magnetic charge to the north or south. Modern interest in the notion originates from particle theories that predict their existence, most notably the grand unified and superstring theories. The known elementary particles that have electric charge are electric monopoles. Experience has shown us that magnetic north and south poles cannot be split into magnetic monopoles or isolated magnetic charges. Peregrinus discussed this in the 13th century. However, there are compelling theoretical reasons to suppose that they should exist. Curie proposed the existence of free magnetic charges in 1894, and magnetic monopoles were occasionally used as mathematical examples in electrodynamics, but physicists only began to take them seriously after Dirac demonstrated in 1931 that their existence would explain the observed quantization of electric charge. Tohuft and Polyakov demonstrated in 1974 that magnetic monopoles exist as nonlinear objects in various particle physics theories. They are, in reality, an unavoidable prediction of the grand unification of elementary particle interactions, and the same holds true for more recent theories of everything, such as superstring theory. Finding a magnetic monopole particle would be a huge step forward in high-energy physics. They get their features from processes that occur at extremely high energy. Yet because they are stable particles that interact via the electromagnetic field, they would be quite simple to examine experimentally. As a result, they may offer up a new window into particle physics at energies beyond the reach of any anticipated accelerator experiments. There have been countless attempts to detect them in various methods, but none have been successful. Despite the fact that monopoles have not yet been discovered at CERN or anywhere else for that matter, researchers were able to fine-tune the likely properties of monopoles through the use of the new experiment which will determine the course of further investigations. While previous experiments at the LHC and elsewhere have limited physicists' ability to draw conclusions, these new experiments using a different production mechanism allow scientists to definitively rule out the existence of certain types of monopoles and have given researchers a much better idea of where the search for monopoles can go next. In July of last year, the LHC smashed together a distinct type of particle heavy ion in the form of lead nuclei. These particles can only collide at lower energy than single proton collisions because they comprise hundreds of protons and neutrons. If these lead nuclei clip or pass very close to each other, the interaction can produce something spectacular, the universe's strongest magnetic field, which can be a million times stronger than that seen in a neutron star. These are only present for a brief time, but they give an alternative mechanism for making magnetic monopoles. The idea is based on a mechanism that generates electrons and their antimatter counterparts, positrons, the electrical equivalent of monopoles. A powerful electrical field will interact with quantum fluctuations in a vacuum, producing electrons and positrons, according to the Schwinger mechanism developed in the 1930s. North and South monopoles should be produced by a strong magnetic field. 
Despite the fact that there was no evidence of monopoles found, the organization issued a very bizarre report about how there was a crack in the magnetic field of the Earth that opened up and stayed open for about 14 hours. The magnetic field breach was created by an uncommon event known as a co-rotating interaction region CIR, from the Sun. CIRs are large-scale plasma structures generated when fast and slow-moving streams of solar wind interact in the low and middle latitude portions of the heliosphere, which contain the solar magnetic field and the solar winds. CIRs are similar to coronal mass ejections. CMEs are ejected from the Sun and can contain shock waves and compressed magnetic fields, resulting in violent space weather, which typically manifests as stunning aurorae. Coronal mass ejections, like solar flares, are created by the Sun's magnetic field bending and realigning, a process known as magnetic reconnection. When magnetic field lines tangle, intense localized magnetic fields are produced that can burst through the Sun's surface at active regions, resulting in CMEs. CMEs are most common around sunspot groups and are frequently followed by a solar flare, though the two may not necessarily occur at the same time. CMEs, like solar flares, are most common during the Sun's 11-year cycle of activity when the star is at its most active. After being released, CMEs grow in size as they move away from the Sun. By the time they reach our planet, large CMEs can span about a fourth of the space between Earth and the Sun. If a CME is large enough and travels faster than the solar wind, it creates a shock wave in which accelerated charged particles go ahead of the CME, disturbing space weather and increasing geomagnetic storms. CMEs, while producing gorgeous auroras, can also be catastrophic. Large CMEs can produce technology problems that are very troublesome in today's environment, like as the Carrington event in 1859, which damaged the global telegraph system. There have been incidents of operators being electrocuted and sparks from telegraph machines igniting papers. According to NASA, a CME followed a solar flare that impacted Earth in 1989, creating a 12-hour power outage in the entire province of Quebec, Canada. The incident cost Quebec's electricity firm Hydro-Quebec at least $10 million. But how do CMEs generate all of this mayhem? CMEs can create electrical current surges that overload power systems, resulting in widespread blackouts, as well as jolting the Earth's magnetic field, which impairs radio broadcasts and increases radio static in the ionosphere. GPS systems are particularly susceptible to ionosphere disturbances, and GPS coordinates have been observed to deviate by tens of feet during a CME event. The disturbance occurs because GPS employs radio signals to transport information between a satellite and a ground receiver. The radio signal travels through the ionosphere layer, which contains charged plasma that bends the GPS signal's path in the same manner as lenses bend light. Normally, GPS systems can correct for radio signal bending while maintaining GPS accuracy. The ionosphere can be so badly disrupted during a CME event that GPS models are unable to keep track of such changes and receivers are unable to derive an accurate position. Furthermore, Earth-orbiting satellites, particularly those in high geosynchronous orbits, where the majority of communication satellites are placed, are vulnerable to CMEs. When a CME generates a geomagnetic storm, satellites can be attacked by a strong current discharged into the satellite or damaged when high-energy particles penetrate the satellite. As a result, susceptible satellites can be switched to safe mode to avoid electronic harm. Last year, SpaceX witnessed firsthand the destruction that space weather can inflict when a geomagnetic storm destroyed up to 40 Starlink satellites valued at more than $50 million in February. So you're probably wondering how these incidents are tied to CERN. The truth is that the break that remained open for 14 hours was caused by one of their tests. The magnetic field shields humanity from solar storms created by the Sun. Previously, it was assumed that they opened and closed fast, but we now know that they remain open for hours. Scientists discovered that a magnetic shield, like a house with a window left open during a storm, deflects the majority of the storm but destroys the couch inside the house. Similarly, our magnetic shield absorbs the majority of the energy from space storms, but some of it escapes, causing issues with satellites, radio communication and power systems. 
The Sun is approaching its most active period in the solar cycle, which will occur around July 2025, and it is already abnormally energetic for this early in the cycle. This indicates that your odds of witnessing the aurora are already high and will improve further over the next three years. However, there are genuine grounds to be concerned about what might happen to Earth's magnetic field. Perhaps the most horrific consequence of losing the Earth's magnetic field would be the loss of the air we breathe, and the culprit would be the solar wind once more. The Sun's natural wind is so powerful that it may readily pull gases from the atmosphere of a planet until there is no gas left. This is most likely what happened to Mars. Mars was most likely once like Earth, with oceans and a dense atmosphere. However, unlike our planet, its magnetic field was lost billions of years ago. Its atmosphere was entirely exposed and torn away into space. When the air pressure dropped low enough, the water began to evaporate and was blown away by the solar wind. It is entirely probable that if our geomagnetic field did not exist, our atmosphere, oceans and life on Earth would perish. But before the atmosphere is stripped away, animal life on our planet will suffer. Humans aren't the only species that rely on the Earth's magnetic field for navigation. Many birds, sea turtles, lobsters, honeybees, salmon and even fruit flies have magnetic compasses incorporated into their bodies. Birds use this capacity to migrate to warmer climes during the winter, while sea turtles use it to cross the wide ocean and select beaches to deposit their eggs. Scientists believe that because of their natural compasses, most female sea turtles return to the same beaches year after year. Many creatures that rely on compass navigation may face grave risk if the Earth's magnetic field disappears. Migratory sea turtles can become disoriented at sea, Birds may fly in the incorrect direction, putting their lives in danger, while honeybees may become bewildered or go in search of their hives, disrupting flower and plant pollination. As their navigational abilities weaken, these and many other creatures may become extinct. Therefore, in order for scientists at CERN to continue with their experiments, they should first consider the entirety of the globe and how their experiments affect us. Also, that's not everything. CERN is also working on many preliminary concepts for a future circular collider. It will be the most powerful particle smasher ever built and its construction will most likely cost between 9 and 21 billion euros. Albeit not everyone is sure that the upcoming circular collider is a worthwhile investment at the time. Sabine Hossenfelders, a theoretical physicist at the Frankfurt University of Advanced Studies in Germany, has argued that there is no reason to believe that such a collider will produce new physics. The high resources involved could be better spent on other massive facilities, such as putting a giant radio telescope on the far side of the moon or putting a gravitational wave detector in orbit. Both would be safer bets than a new collider, given that the LHC is still conducting its third run and preparing for a fourth, both of which would contribute more than enough to particle physics for the time being. Let us know what you think about the CERN experiments and how they will affect us in the comments section below.